say, I believe, therefore I'm going to speak. And y'all just try to shut your <laughs> up. <laughs> oh, and, and boy, when he cut loose, it, it was a lot of good stuff. I actually see the gospel in this kind of picture. In the gospel, I'll just kind of paraphrase here a few things. If, if man has a messenger, a mediator, to show him what's right, then the mediator is gracious to him and says, oh, let's don't deliver him to the pit. For I found a ransom. Uh, now you know and I know in the face of Jesus, he's the messenger and he's the mediator and he is the ransom. Amen. So Elihu, just, Jesus just wrapped all of this up in one here. And what happened as he was talking to Job about his restoration and recovery? He says, he'll pray to God. He'll delight in God. He shall see his face with joy. See? For God restores to man his righteousness. Not Job's righteousness. God's righteousness. All of this in order that the man may be enlightened God shines his light into your heart to give you the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. God, as Elihu says, that that man may be enlightened with the light of life. All of these are prefiguring, of course. The only way you're going to achieve a relationship with God is with Christ, in the face of Christ. So, it's very easy to see that Christ suffered once for sins, to bring us to God. See, now we got him. Through Jesus, we have access to the Father. Through faith, of course. In Jesus, we have obtained access by faith into this grace, light, and therefore we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now I'm going to tell you, if you ever see Jesus, you'll know God. And it always brings me back to my knees. Always. Their infinite glory meets the lowest humility. You see it in Jesus. God has to have it. Deepest reverence for his Father meets equality with God. Infinite majesty meets amazing meekness. Infinite worthiness of everything good of our Savior meets the greatest patience to suffer every kind of evil. Demanding justice meets loving kindness and mercy. It's all right there in the person of Jesus Christ. That's why. It's in his person. Now I conclude, but not quickly, with these remarks. It's very easy to me to see that in this, that your salvation is not number one in God's mind. God's glory is the first thing in his mind. But he's going to get more of it if he saves you. So his first allegiance to himself. If his first allegiance wasn't to himself, would you want a, him to be your first allegiance? I don't think so. You'd have no hope of finding happiness in him if his first allegiance wasn't to himself. Now I thought about this, and I and thought maybe I better not say, but I'll just say it anyway. Do you believe God's sovereign? How can somebody that's sovereign not be happy? It must be the most happy. His will can't be thwarted. He's in heaven and do what he wants to. How can he not be happy? A satisfied, happy God is our foundation for our joy and our happiness. Amen. That means when you that light shines, and you get to him, he's not out of sorts. 
That's a neat Texas expression if you don't understand. He's not mad when you get to him. So whatever goals and purposes God has, they're all subordinated to exalt in the value of his glory. Now Jesus reflects that, bears the very stamp of his uh, nature. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. Isaiah, does he delight your soul? Naturally. Now see, in creation, God goes public with this glory. Oh, he already had it. Now, it had to be a wonderful uh, uh, relationship between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, but that reverberated joyfully between them. They had to be happy. But it's, it's like that glory just kind of, and that happiness just kind of had to spill over in creation. You see the glory in creation? Do you see a greater glory in recreation? Yes. Can you see a greater glory in sanctification? Yes. Will you see a greater glory in your glorification? Amen. See, that's going from glory unto glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord, as God has shined His light into you. Now, I've already answered this question, but I want to remind you of it. When you want a gift of God, what's a, why don't you go for the best one? What's the best thing that God can give you? There's only one answer, himself. Amen. If you don't leave with any other thing, take that with you. And what do you give? Oh, and what do you do with a gift that you are so proud of? and so happy with, you praise it. Is that not what worship is? Yes, amen. Well, I thought it was keeping five rituals on Sunday morning appointed hours. I'll tell you what. Now, the only compassion I have for most of the world that has no idea what worship is is I've been in their shoes. But I despise it, and I hate that people do not understand what worship is. Amen. You will spontaneously praise what you value, Amen. and that is worship. Amen. And you try to legislate spontaneity, and you will get it messed up. Like our delight and our happiness is really incomplete until we express it in praise. I believe, therefore I speak. How about, I am satisfied with you, God, and I will worship you. I praise you. Now God's pursuit, he wants to be praised. And my pursuit of joy in him, they're the same pursuit. They're just the same, they're the same coin, different sides. Now that's the great gospel. And I wouldn't know that if I hadn't studied Paul. So the exact circumstance that can bring me the greatest satisfaction is precisely what delights God. I will make them an everlasting covenant. I will not turn from them away doing good unto them. I will rejoice in doing them good with all my heart and with all my soul. Now, <clears throat> can I leave you with this thought? Kingdom of heaven is like a treasure, which out of joy the man bought. 